My name is Ian Scott. I founded Maltex Energy back in 2014. It seems longer ago than that. Maltex Energy is quite unashamedly focused on cost. The Western world will nuclearize and decarbonize because it's the right thing to do. If you look at the world as a whole, it will not. The key to getting clean energy around the world is to make it cheaper than burning coal and gas. And that's really the driver behind our mission. Nuclear has an enormous challenge, sometimes understated. We all know about nuclear's capital cost is too expensive. That's not exactly news. What's less commonly known is that the market for what's called firm electricity, as in electricity where the market's always there, and if you produce 24 hours, seven days a week, somebody will buy it at a decent price. That market is going away. There are large periods of time in any country with significant renewable penetration where renewables can actually provide all of the energy. And there's no market left for nuclear. Renewables produce at zero marginal cost. And this is real. In the UK this year, we had an entire week where wholesale prices, and the UK is a free and competitive market, so these are real market prices, they averaged minus seven pounds, so minus ten dollars per megawatt hour over the week. Not just in one hour, averaged over the entire week. The prices actually went down to minus eighty dollars per megawatt hour at one period. That's the world we're now operating in. And for us to be successful in that, we really need capital and fixed costs to be such that we are profitable at thirty to fifty percent capacity factor without subsidy. And that is a very, very major challenge, which will only be achieved through radical innovation, which is what Maltex Energy is all about. We believe we can meet that cost objective and indeed meet it quite comfortably by focusing on two things. One is intrinsic safety. If you need to make your reactor safe by engineering it to be safe, you're doing it the wrong way. And simplicity. Simplicity is cheap. There are two broad classes of molten reactor in the world. The first is what I call conventional MSRs. It's hard to use the word conventional and there's only a couple of them ever been built. But this is where you have a molten salt fuel which passes between a reaction chamber where it undergoes fission, it gets hot, and then passes through a heat exchanger where it gives the heat away to do something useful. This is what the molten salt reactor experiment was. It's what virtually every design of molten salt reactor in the world today is. And then you've got the stable salt reactor platform, which is our technology, putting the fuel salt into essentially conventional fuel assemblies. And the reason it's new goes back right back to the picture, which is actually behind David on his screen of the aircraft reactor experiment. It was actually one of the very first ideas that was considered for the aircraft reactor experiment. And it was rejected. And it was rejected because they calculated the heat couldn't get out from the fuel salt through the tube wall to the coolant. What's less commonly understood is that the reason for that was that they had to ignore convection as a heat transfer mechanism because they were producing a reactor for an aircraft. On an aircraft, you can't rely on gravity, which means you can't rely on convection. And if you don't have convection in a fluid, fluids are really terrible transfer mechanisms for heat. They've got very poor thermal conductivity. So when people gave up on the, frankly, insane idea of putting nuclear reactors into aircraft and said, OK, we'll keep these on the ground, that fundamental decision was never reconsidered until we reconsidered it back in 2013, 2014. There are many, many ways you could use molten salt fuel in sealed or unsealed tubes to develop a reactor. There's probably hundreds of them. We're developing two. The first is a fast spectrum reactor we call the waste burner. SSR stands for stable salt reactor waste burner. This is fueled by plutonium hyaluronides, chloride salt fuel. I'll say more about this reactor as I go through the presentation. The second is a thermal spectrum reactor, which I will say very, very much less about. In fact, I will say no more than was on this slide. This is a graphite moderated reactor, uranium sodium fluoride fuel salt. The cool salt is proprietary. I won't be talking about that. Very high output temperature, output temperature up where the high temperature gas reactors are, which economically is actually very valuable. And this is a project which we are developing technically, but we're also in active discussion with potential customers. Our intention is to develop both of these reactors in parallel. We see them as highly complementary. One is really good for cleaning up the mess of spent fuel the first nuclear era has left behind. The second is a way of spreading cheap nuclear energy around the world in a safe way. Okay, let me talk about the waste burner. The company, as I mentioned, was founded in 2014 and the master patent was granted. So the simple concept of putting molten salt fuel in tubes is patentable, has been patented, and that patent has been granted in every major jurisdiction in the world now, including the USA, Canada, Japan, Korea, China. We didn't bother about Russia because you can't enforce them, no point. 
and throughout the EU. Between 2014 and 2018, we did a lot of work on developing technology. And in 2018, we established Multics Energy Canada, and we granted that company exclusive rights to the SSRW throughout North America. In part of that, we'd signed a $5 million investment agreement with New Brunswick Power. We are moving ahead in Canada with that technology. Don't ask me why we're not developing that technology in the UK, because I'll probably give far too long an answer. The last two years, we commenced the CNSC Vendor Design Review, which is a bit of an inspired innovation, I have to say, by the Canadians. It allows very early engagement with the regulator, which we find extremely useful. We've also received some major investments, including from the established nuclear industry, which is actually quite important. The incredible within the nuclear industry is very, very important to our way forward. We started co-funded research with Canadian Nuclear Labs on spent fuel recycling, which I will say a bit more about. And thank you very much to the USA. We have received generous funding through the ARPA-E program to carry out research in the US National Labs in support of our program, which is generous and visionary of the Department of Energy. Over the last two years, our design has evolved significantly. I know many people are interested. The drivers of change have come from this engagement with the Canadian process. Feedback from the regulator during CNSC phase one has been invaluable. We've also had very good feedback from New Brunswick Power, who intend to be the operator of our first of kind plant in New Brunswick. The input from somebody who's actually experienced in operating real nuclear plants is really very valuable. And then the science. We know a lot more about the neutronics and thermal hydraulics than we did four years ago, the waste burner. It's a 1,250 megawatt thermal, 500 megawatt electric output at a temperature of 600 degrees centigrade. The fuel, a uranium plutonium americium chloride mixture. The key thing is the fuel assemblies are designed to be replaced with the actor full power. It's a simple replacement mechanism. The assembly is taken out of the core with a crane, put into storage and replaced. By doing continuous refueling, you do not have large excess reactivity in the core at any time. That eliminates a large number of potentially catastrophic faults. So intrinsic safety is important. And having only just enough for some material in the core is a big intrinsic safety factor. Like all molten salt reactors, we have a high negative temperature coefficient. Everybody knows about that, so we'll put more emphasis on this. But it means that we don't actually need shutdown rods. We can shut down on temperature alone, but we choose not to. We have boron rods, so we can shut this reactor down cold. But they are shutdown rods. They are not control rods. They're either all in or all out. And one innovation which we're really very pleased about, we haven't really talked about before, we have a novel and patented heat exchanger system which we believe permits the elimination of the intermediate coolant loop. Almost all molten salt reactors have their primary coolant salt, and then a secondary loop, and then the tertiary loop. And each of those loses temperature, each adds cost. We believe we have eliminated that. Probably the biggest change from the design, which some of you on this call will be familiar with, which is the rectangular core design on this picture, and our current design is the elimination of fuel shuffling. This is an important change we've instituted. The design we had four years ago was a rectangular core, which allowed you to actually move fuel assemblies sideways through the core steadily in a counterflow pattern. This was a thing of some beauty. It allowed really very, very high burn-up to be achieved through the neutronics. And in theory, this rectangular arrangement allowed you to scale the reactor simply by making the tank longer and longer and longer. The revised design doesn't do either of those things. Our experienced operator said the idea of moving every fuel assembly 10 times in its life wasn't ideal. And this is from a company that operates a reactor that already does that. The Candu reactor moves each fuel assembly multiple times. So that is something to listen to. Jamming of fuel assemblies is one of the nightmare scenarios in the Candu reactor. We also found that when we got to do the detailed design for the mechanism through that fuel shuffling, it can be done. It's actually relatively complex. And complexity costs money and leads to reliability concerns. And finally, and this was a surprise, the regulators made it very clear to us, easy scaling of reactor core by adding modules into a rectangular core wouldn't work. Each different size would be treated for regulatory purposes as being a new reactor, which destroys the economics of that approach. The consequences of this change are actually pretty much all positive. We are looking at a significant reduction in operating cost and complexity. It means we have to go to a single reactor size and we selected 500 megawatts on economic grounds as being the optimum. That's actually driven very strongly by something I'm not going to talk about today, which is our use of a thermal storage technology we call grid reserve, which allows that 500 megawatt reactor to operate as a 1,500 megawatt power plant operating at 33% capacity factor, which economically is really where nuclear has to be. 
And the penalty is a minor reduction in our potential burn up. But as it happens, we found that the burn was actually limited by the neutron irradiation data available for materials. So the theoretical advantage we thought we would get, we couldn't actually achieve. That's where I'll end. It is a new platform technology. There are many, many ways of employing this in reactors. We encourage people around the world to come up with ideas for how to do that. And I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ian. It's a very interesting presentation. What's the vision for fuel disposition? The source of fuel for this is actually spent candy fuel, which conventionally is almost a non-reprocessable nuclear fuel because its plutonium content is really very low, 0.38% versus sort of 1 to 1.2% for PWR fuel. We have demented and patented a process pretty much specifically designed for candy fuel, which recovers that plutonium at very low cost. That same process will take waste fuel from our reactor and put it back in. The reactor is a parcel spectrum reactor. We can indefinitely recycle that fuel until literally all the higher actinides are burned up. We accumulate some very higher actinides over the course of fuel life, but they don't get to the point where they make the fuel impossible. So we see this as something which can literally burn 100% of the higher actinides in spent fuel. The kit to do that is essentially the kit we use to produce our fuel in the first place which we are currently developing with Chalk River Labs. How do you handle fission gas accumulation? We elect to vent our fuel tubes. We can do that because, as you all know, molten salts hang on to the dangerous fission products exceptionally well. And so the vented gas is not non-radioactive, but the dominant reactivity is actually Krypton-85. That is allowed to accumulate in the containment structure of the reactor and would be, we expect, released to atmosphere at decommissioning as Krypton-85 is released from every refueling plant in the world. If not, it would have to be absorbed into graphite. There is technology to do that. It depends on the extent to which the environmental impact of Krypton-85 is viewed differently in 60 years' time than the way it was viewed 20 years ago. The thermophysical properties are uncertain, especially with fission products building in. Without the properties, you cannot know the heat transfer coefficient. If you don't know that, how can you predict the cladding temperature and get your fuel qualified? This is a really interesting question. Heat transfer in molten salts, especially at high temperature, is extremely complex. Extremely complex. Our intention is to avoid that. We are experimentally determining the heat transfer coefficient between the molten fuel salt and coolant salt, literally doing it empirically. So we will determine the heat transfer coefficient under the full range of conditions and use that. So we are not going to rely on thermohydraulic modelling for heat transfer calculation. We would see that as being very hard to justify to the regulators, whereas simple data is much more acceptable. Thank you once again, Ian, for a very interesting presentation. My pleasure. Uh, 